Coming up on Theater Talk. We reached out to Cheryl on social media and she was coming to LA the next day and we made, what, what do I call it? A hug deal, not a handshake. <laughs> we hugged and she said, the book is yours. And I started writing that day. Not bad. It <laughs> doesn't usually work that way. Dear Sugar, if love were an animal, what species would it be, and could you train it? <laughs> I think love would be two animals, a snake and a hummingbird. Both are perfectly untrainable. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and here is my guest co-host, Warren Light, Tony Award-winning playwright and longtime showrunner of SVU and Peabody Award winner for Law and Order SVU and Peabody Award winner for In Treatment. And now you're on to other things, but now I'm here. Now you're here. <laughs> now you're here. And we are going to talk about a wonderful, wonderful show at the Public Theater, Tiny Beautiful Things. We are joined by the co-creator and star of Tiny Beautiful Things, Nia Vardalis. Hello. And co-creator Marshall Heyman who I met many years ago in another life when you were writing for the New York Observer, but now you're just one of the mainstays of the New York scene right. and working on this. How did you first get this project going? Jody Cantor from the New York Times was at this writer's conference. That yeah, Jody I was at. Cantor, who's Jody really... Cantor. Just, She's been in the news lately. She, <laughs> has, she really has. But before all this, she was at a writer's conference that I went to, and she was talking in one of the sort of salons that they were having about somebody when women at the New York Times would come to her and ask her for advice, she would say, you know what, you should just read this book, Tiny Beautiful Things by Cheryl Strayed. And she had bought a stack of them and she would just hand them off to people when they would come to her in the office. And so I, I thought to myself, oh, I should probably read that book. I, you know, I will occasionally dip into self-helpy kind of things. And so I, I immediately read it. And as I was reading it, I was like, this is amazing. This should be shared with people. I think it could be a play. I think it could be something interesting. And so I have been friends with Tommy Kale for a while. Um, and Tommy Kale won a Tony for Hamilton and is just the it director of the day. But this was before Hamilton, before I really even knew about Hamilton. And I, I remember that I texted him and I said, will you just check out this book? I, I think there's something there because we would have lunch and go to the theater and talk about possible things. And I would always give him stuff to read and he would tell me what to read and stuff like that. And so a few weeks later, he texted me and said, you know, I think this is great, let's, let's try to do this. And so we separately tried to get in touch with Cheryl. Um, he sort of stalked her on social media, although he has no social media presence, so I don't really know how that worked out. But, and then I went to go meet with her agent at the time in Los Angeles, and she had just, Cheryl had, she told me that she had just gone to production on Wild, which was the movie that starred Reese Witherspoon and was based on her memoir about walking the Pacific Crest Trail. And that she wasn't bringing her any projects, but Cheryl had been interested in sort of maybe doing something as like an animated interstitial thing with these sort of questions and answers in this book. Because the book is basically a book of advice. It's that Cheryl wrote as a col like she wrote columns for the rumpus and it was collected in this book around the time that Wilde was published because it was such a popular column online. And so I was sort of stalking the agent, being like, hey, let's try to kind of see if we can make this happen. Is Cheryl ready to talk about it? Tommy was doing his own thing, emailing Cheryl. She wasn't replying. He was working with you on the 24-hour plays, is that yeah, right? Yeah, we met yeah, okay. on 24-hour plays. Into the story. Well, Tommy and I met in 2010, and um, we had been friends and looking for something to do together. So Tommy said, um, we will find something to work to get on together. And I said, okay, and he keeps his promises. So after Marshall gave Tommy the book, and Tommy was so affected by it, I happened to be in New York, and Tommy gave me the book and said, I think this is it. I think this is something we should work on together. I think it's a play. And I said, what is it? And I thumbed thumb through it, and it was an epistolary exchange. I was like, I don't know how it's, I mean, I knew and admired Cheryl Strayed's work from Wild, but I said, I'll read it. And I read it on the plane, and 
I'm telling you that I'm sure the flight attendants were like, something is wrong with Big Fat Greek Girl. Because I was <laughs> weeping in my seat. Weeping not because it's filled with grief, but because it's filled with empathy and compassion and understanding and transparency. These readers are so brave, real people who reach out and say, this is happening to me. And Cheryl says, I hear you. I'm going to tell you something that happened to me in the hope that perhaps there is something that is illuminating in it. So I landed and said, this is a play, call Tommy. We reached out to Cheryl on social media and she was coming to LA the next day. And we made, what, what do I call it? A hug deal, not a handshake. <laughs> we hugged and she said, the book is yours. Not bad. It <laughs> doesn't usually work that way. No. But I, you know, the key thing is you didn't involve any agents or business people in it. It was just, Yeah. she just writes from the heart and it sounds like you just approached her. Yes. That well, I, I assured her that Marshall and Tommy and I would respect her and honor her work. You you know, I, she said, do you think that maybe I could be involved? And we were like, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Even though, yes, I sat down, I started to take the book. Tommy came to Los Angeles and we put post-it notes up on the wall of which pieces we felt could make it into, make it uh, an arc, a trajectory in the piece. Mm -hmm. Of course we asked Cheryl's help and advice and then we had workshops and of course she came. And you know, it's, it was a beautiful, open relationship with no one ever worrying that they were stepping on toes. We would try a workshop, Tommy would go to Marshall, Marshall would come in every, I would say every two or three days with fresh eyes mm -hmm. on the piece. It just worked. I'm thinking of when you said about there's no agents and all that involved. Warren, I first met you when you wrote Sideman and I saw it at CSC and I called you on the phone. I looked you up in the phone book and called <laughs> you during intermission <laughs> to invite you on this show. Mm -hmm. But then you too, and you with My Big Fat Greek Wedding, have moved into this world of agents and representatives and studios and all this stuff. And one wonders how you keep your clear heads well, as writers. Well, significantly, you met Tommy at the 24-hour project, yeah. which I do as often as I can. And that is a pure, this is a, an evening to raise money for charity. 30 actors, 10 writers and directors show up on a Sunday night. Uh, you meet each other, they, people bring a prop and a costume item. Then the actors go away and the writers spend all night writing a play for free. Each person writes his own or her own one act. Writers go to sleep, directors come in, they, uh, they start rehearsing and they put it up that night in front of 500 people off book. And it's never, it's, it's, it's as pure as we can get these days, yeah. I think. And look what happened. You, you meet people that way and you're just creating and there's a certain element of panic to it. Yeah, it's wonderful because your true self is exposed when you're under pressure. You it's play great. Cheryl Strait, who's Dear Sugar. She's yeah. anonymous at the time she's writing these columns. Mm -hmm. And then you're, the other actors play all these different people writing these letters to you. Yeah. And Marshall, in terms of the letters, what struck you about, what, what's the tone of these letters that so drew you in? Well, I thought some of them were so funny and some of them were so painful, but there was just an uh, unbelievable sort of honesty and sort of braveness and sort of putting that feeling out there. And what always struck me so much about the, the, the book and, and the original columns that Cheryl wrote were, was just like how her advice was just cut to the bone and it just kind of went to the, like, you know, it, it, it just, I had not heard st people talk like that. I wouldn't even call it advice. Uh, it, it's, it's something larger. I, w w yeah. would, you I would, would you call her an advice columnist, really? I mean, now I wouldn't. At the time that I read the book, I thought it was advice. And the more I got to know Cheryl Strayed, would you say it's more that it's a sharing of life experiences. Right. It's also just a kind of a memoir as much as yeah. it is and mm -hmm. it, it's a series of advice. Mm -hmm. I mean it's kind of a parallel to Wild in that so much of it is about her life experiences mm -hmm. and the things that happened to her and her friends and you know but um, and it, she did some stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> she lived mm -hmm. quite a life. Now you Warren for years and years you sort of humbly express this as your day job but you did this remarkable work on Law and Order SVU where you're dealing with all kinds of tortured situations and people and one wonders like with with the, uh, tiny beautiful things how do you keep yourself dispassionate from d all this human misery well you don't I don't think I think you absorb a lot of it and you listen the hard thing for me and I'm sure this has happened to both of you uh, after Sideman and even after, people see something you've written like that and then they want to come up and share something, disclose often something yeah. that they've never, anonymity or the fact that 
they know you're going to go away in five minutes the same way you can write a letter anonymously. Yeah. A lot of people, that, sometimes people will say, I never told anyone this. And then they'll tell you a heartbreaking story or, or a horrifying story. Yeah. And I, I came to understand that was a responsibility of being on a show like SVU. I just try to, to listen and be present. And, and yeah. uh, But it, was, it took me a while to understand that's, that's part of what happens when you open yourself up the way Cheryl does or you do on stage. It is a huge responsibility to play Sugar on stage because I do come out and people tell me things, Warren, uh -huh. and I, I just try to be present and listen because I'm not Cheryl Strayed, but sh I've seen her do it and she yeah. just takes it in and listens without judgment and can't we just all do this right now <laughs> in the state of our world right now? I think we do need to listen more. This is why I think the piece is resounding with people and why we keep getting it extended. I believe we're in a dire state, no matter what your politics are. Right now, people are feeling scared. And there, this is a place where you can go for 90 minutes and cry, Democrat right beside a Republican. Sure you can. The experience I had watching play was cathartic. I, 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 was, I was the guy in the sixth row just I should have, bring tissues if you're going to see the play. <laughs> Very true. Just bring That's tissues. Right. Right. I, I don't think you have to read the book in advance no. at all. I no. think it's better. I came in cold yeah. and just was was moved all the way through. Like a good Al-Anon meeting or a good church service, you felt better at the end of it. That you'd go, you go, you go through a catharsis listening to all these people struggling to survive and get over things that one should in an ideal world one wouldn't have had to face. Yeah, and like Marshall is saying, because there are pieces in the book that are funny, we really felt it was important to include things because it, we need all emotions. Yeah. Every, you gotta eat everything, eat carbs, everything. You gotta eat protein, sugar, carbs, fat, everything. And in the play, that's what we were hoping to show is just the wide variety of everything that people go through. Of course, it was horrible, the pieces that I couldn't include in the play. So we always say to people, afterward, buy the book. Afterward, right. afterward, buy, yeah. buy the book. Right. Yeah. Tiny, beautiful things. <laughs> yeah. so, well, I want to tell everybody that this you can still go see this play. It's at the public until December 10th. 10th. Yeah. Uh -huh. I hope they're going to tape it for some future purpose. Oh, okay. that's yes, nice. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll bring a camera down. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll just On your iPhone. Yeah. That's right. And then Nia Vardalis, you're probably headed back to Los Angeles to do some cool thing. I'm sure you're hatching. <laughs> I'm doing some things. Yes. Marshall Heyman. Now, you, you, you are now writing a TV show based on the wonderful book Diet Land. Yes, yes. yes. So I'm not writing, I'm writing on it. Well, you're yes, writing I'm on it. That sounds pretty about, good. Yes, and Warren fun. Light, my guest co-host. What I, are you working on? Uh, as we speak, I'm developing television ideas <laughs> for Sony. As, as we sit here, this itself could be an idea for Sony television. Yes, I, I, I think so. Uh -huh. I'm, 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 in, I'm in development, uh, which is probably a, a metaphor. And off of the, the Law and Order track at long last. I took a little break. Uh, it was, it was a, I thought I would be there for a year, and it, 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 five years went by. Uh, it's a little bit like child raising. It, every day seems to be endless, and then where did those five years go? Yeah, yep. it's a little yep. bit like that. And on you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, tiny beautiful things, Nia Vardalos, Marshall Heyman. I hope Thanks. to see you again soon. You will. War on Light. I know I'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you had to give one piece of advice to people in their twenties, what would it be? Be about ten times more generous than you believe yourself capable of being. Why? Because in your 20s, you're becoming who you're going to be, so you might as well not become an a**. <laughs> Here with me is my guest co-host, Donna Hanover of Arts in the City on CUNY TV. Salute to the Brave is a play by Noel Coward that was never, ever performed remarkably, but they're going to premiere it on November 13th in New York City at the Actors Company Theater, and we're going to talk about it this week. Here with us is Scott Allen Evans, the Executive Artistic Director of TACT, yes. as you call it. Jeffrey Johnson, who was a colleague of Noel Coward's, also a renowned casting director, but you were a colleague of Noel Coward's when you were, were a director, right. yes. Right. And also is now on the advising executive board of the Noel Coward Foundation. Trustee. Trustee, you're <laughs> very involved with the Noel Coward Foundation. and we have one of the most eminent cowardian, cowardian actresses of the day, Christine <laughs> Nielsen. Welcome back. Christine was in Present Laughter last season with Kevin Klein. Oh, no. 
Monica, come here at once. What on earth is the matter? Have you or have you not seen me overact? Frequently. <laughs> and she's been in a lot of other great stuff, and she's going to be in Salute to the Brave at the TAC Theatre Company on November 13th. You're playing a, a, a superficial American, right? Yeah. Well, which will be very hard. <laughs> <laughs> I've started work now. <laughs> My research. <laughs> so, so, Scott, why was this play never produced? Well, it's a, it's a fascinating story. Um, as you may know, Coward, and Jeffrey can talk about this, yes. but Coward was a, 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 an official espionage spy for the British government during the war World and war II, yeah. was, uh, did a lot of uh, intelligence gathering as he traveled around the world. Um, and he was very pro, obviously pro-Britain, and uh, wanted to do something to help encourage America to enter the war because at that time there was huge isolationism Lindbergh, uh, a lot uh, of our and a lot of resistance for, yeah. New, uh, for America to... Yes, to Barry fight. Day, who is not here, the, the eminent Coward scholar who found this play right. among the papers <laughs> of Noel Coward, told me, he said, well, you know, Errol Flynn was a Nazi sympathizer. That's right. But <laughs> oh. And Cary oh. Grant was a spy. I never knew that. Evidently. For the Nazis? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this play uh, was discovered in a drawer, and... Uh, Tact has a history of looking at these forgotten plays, and actually we have done several of Noel Coward's lesser-known works. We did the American premiere of a play called Long Island Sound in 2002, and we've done several Coward plays. So Barry brought it to our attention, and, uh, you know, I had that experience where I read it last summer, and, you know, it's a fascinating play. But then when I read it again after last November, and everything changed, it was imperative that we do this play. It is so incredibly prescient and suddenly relevant in all sorts of interesting ways. But why, why after November would this play be more prescient? Well, that's a very loaded question. It Susan. certainly is. Thank you very much for that. No, I think it's just that uh, nativism is a very dangerous uh, uh, question right now in this time versus nationalism versus patriotism. And I think it's finding that uh, uh, what Noel Coward has done with great wit and uh, with hopefully some laughs on the way to answering that question of what is really, really important, uh, which I think is much more to be nationalistic and patriotic and also be an open society. This is very understanding. This is such a gracious approach to changing a country's attitude about entering a war. Right. Absolutely. Right. What's, right. what's fascinating about it, too, is that because he was such an amazing writer, it's so subtle, and so there's no, there's no heavy-handedness in it, as Christine was saying. It's, it's a very kind of, um, kind of a beautiful way of kind of convincing someone in a, in, by not taking a direct approach. He, he's trying to con cajole these isolationist Americans in the late 30s yes. into taking... Some this action. Problem seriously. Yeah, exactly. Right. And also yeah. to take our ally, which was was Great Britain, uh, seriously. And uh, they are one of our closest allies. And it is good to acknowledge that right. Right. that they that they help us and we help them. And it's good to be the good friend in bad times and good times. And the Nazis were threatening after Britain coming over here. I think the the reason that it didn't get on was that after Noel Coward finished the play, this attack on Pearl Harbor. Right, right. I immediately followed it. So. Yeah, that was it, in the, the drawer. Yeah, the ink wasn't dry, really, and yeah. the harbor happened, and the need was gone. But uh, that's absolutely right. And the play takes place in September of 1940, which is just when the Blitz started. <laughs> and one of the main characters, uh, Layla, who comes to visit Christine's character, Norma, in Connecticut, um, escapes the bombing. And the pr through the process of the play, her kind of her eyes are kind of the scales fall from her eyes, and she realizes the values she had before that are kind of represented here in Connecticut are not the values that matter anymore. Mm. And that's what's so kind of brilliant about that. This and play. and and what is so current? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Now, Jeffrey, you knew Noel Coward. Yes. Did he, what, do you, do you think he had any regret about these plays of his that didn't get on? That like this one, Salute to the Brave. I I really don't think so. I think he just he kept going. Certainly before I knew him and worked with him. Yes. Because that was a bit later. I'm a little. You're a bit younger. Uh, younger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I almost had it wrong there. But uh, the thing about uh, being around Noel when I worked for him is I, uh, 
I was very seldom alone with him. There are a lot of questions now, today, I wish I had asked him. Things about his youth and how he started and about the early days with the vortex, which really put him on the map. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did have a chance once. I was alone with him for an hour in Switzerland. I was visiting his home in Switzerland. And he, uh, I asked him some questions about his writing and how he, you know, when he was really writing, because when, when uh, this incident, when I was talking to him, he wasn't writing so much. It was in his later years. But uh, uh, he said he had a, a schedule. He would uh, wake up in the morning early, 7 o'clock. He would uh, have coffee brought to him. That's all he had. Uh, then he'd get, after the coffee, he'd get out of bed, he'd go into his workroom, he'd sit, and he started out writing in longhand. Very, very small longhand. Uh, uh, some of the, the manuscripts which we have in the Noel Coward archive, which is part of the Noel Coward Foundation, uh, uh, you look at this teeny, weeny. I mean, I saw the original script for Hay Fever, which is one of his most popular plays, as you know. And uh, I couldn't believe how small the <laughs> handwriting was. And it was in pencil. And it was as if it had been written yesterday. Why are people going to want to see this play in addition to supporting yes, the organization? Right. Yes. What are they going right. to come away with? Are they going to have laughed all night? What, what it's gonna be like, what's it going to be like for the viewer? I hope it's that. I hope you start laughing. And then I hope you start thinking. That's right. That's what that's, I'd that's, say. That's, I, I feel like that's the, it, the character I think. of Norma, it was so fascinating to me because it's the person with the blinders on. They have all the right, they say all the right things and they do all the right committees and they do all the, but they're not really sacrificing anything. And so it's fascinating to learn um, to get bigger than yourself. You know, this woman you discover, you know, is probably supremely self-centered which I think in many ways America is. You know, we're very, we're very uh, egocentric. I yes. think it's like our country, let's right. make it great again. I, I think the other thing you come away with is, and this is something that is super fascinating to me, is how we keep, you know, history really teaches us and we keep going through similar experiences and we can see now what we're going through through a lens of 1940, 41, mm. and how mm -hmm. similar it is as we look at what's happening today. Why didn't he pull this play out and have it produced? I mean, if it's a good play, why did it have to be only kind of like a, the message? I, I, I well, I think he probably pulled another play out. Yeah, because yeah, he, he, he was, yeah. he, he, it was incredible. Yeah. Because I said to him when I was talking about his writing, I said, and, and you went in after the coffee and you started working, because then he started typing, he told me, he, after he finish this scroll, but uh, uh, he didn't do that anymore. But he said, uh, sometimes I'd go and I'd sit there and it wouldn't come. And I would, I had a thing that I would do, I would sit at the, at my desk until two o'clock mm. when I had my lunch. And then the rest of the day was for me. I could do anything I wanted. But he said, uh, some days nothing came. I would just stare either at the typewriter or at the pencils or whatever. But, and then other days, it just it flowed goes. like crazy. And I said, well, a lot of it flowed <laughs> it, because it, what he, you know, he wrote so many plays. We, uh, just, we just had uh, Stephen Adley Gurgis on the playwright, and he said that the, the key to being a writer is you have to get yourself to the table and stay there. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's well, very also true, Coward I is think. famously known for writing these brilliant plays in the incredibly short period of time. Mm. That's right. I mean, Hay Fever, he wrote in over a weekend, I yes, think. And, so right. have you got a, a stack of of no coward plays that are going to be produced by you guys. <laughs> well, as long as the No Coward Foundation keeps sending them to us, <laughs> right? And Little during there. during the uh, um, the the British when Br Britain was involved in the war, he decided he wasn't going to write a play for a year. He said, uh, "I just I, I'm going to do other things." I mean, he entertained the troops, uh, and he made uh, one of the greatest war films of all times, in right. which we served. Yeah, that's right. That's where he right. played Mountbatten. Yeah. And also, he wrote *Light but, Spirit* during the uh, war. But <laughs> after <laughs> a year, <laughs> he said, "I don't know." He was somewhere with his good friend Joyce Carey, and uh, I think in Australia. And suddenly, he thought about this play, and uh, 
he wrote it in six play, uh, six days. Of but course. Present laughter was the same. Right. Yes. That, yes, he, I he, think so. That was done, and they he stopped it because it was the war started, ah. you know, and it was not. Mm -hmm. That's right. The right time. It, it wasn't the right time, and yeah. he didn't want that to be the play to start the with the war. Right. Yeah, because right. it was again a smaller play, you know, smaller in scope with mm -hmm. the. Right. Uh, Alasso was very interesting because he was the artist surrounded by all these people that one person couldn't talk to him alone. We have one minute left, Donna. Oh, well, I understand that he and Churchill butted heads. Is that true? I have that's, that. what, that's what I, the research I've, I've had I've been told was that, that. Yeah. I mean, I've been told that by Didn't Noel. You, by Noel, <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> Well, that's a pretty better, good source. The better source, yes. <laughs> and, well, let's tell the story about the, that we've uh, talked about, about the knighthood. If you want. Oh, yes. That uh, he, well, there was a, when he was a spy, he was supposed to go get this high level uh, assignment, and evidently the word came down from Churchill that no, we were not going to use Noel. Yeah, he didn't. All right, well, the time has flown. Yeah, absolutely. But, what, but November 13th. November 13th at the Scholastic Theater, and we have an amazing cast, including Christine, but Chris, uh, Jennifer Ely. Reed Burney, Cynthia Harris, Simon Jones, Peter Bartlett, Lorenzo Pisoni. It's heaven. And an Chris amazing Lee List Wilson. Is heaven. Yes. All it's a star. Great cast. Yeah. And yeah, it's a fantastic cast. Yes. A, another <laughs> production of at the Wonderful Tact of the Wonderful Tact Theater Company. Yes. So thank you so much, thank Scott you. Allen Evans. Thank you so much, Christine Nielsen. Thank you so much, Jeffrey Johnson. All right. Thank you, Donna Hanover. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see you all next week. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.